Hello and welcome to Dinesh Warda Cities ABC series. We are a fast-growing YouTube podcast thought leadership channel and TV series focused on profiling the global leading inspiring people, CEOs, authors, technologists, academic and global experts changing and creating solutions to, the, to our world and as well people that are inspiring. We are light the ideas products, inventions, software, platforms, books and solutions to the multiple challenges and opportunities we face in our cities and nations with the advent of uh, all the different paraphernalia of technologies and emergent technologies and as well the concepts of Society 5.0, digital transformation, the so-called fourth industrial revolution and of course a lot of things related from social media, AI, blockchain, fintech, IoT and a lot of more. This podcast series uh, are produced and distributed on our platform Mothership, uh, citiesabc.com and openbusinesscouncil.org. Uh, citiesabc.com is a platform to highlight a bit of a terminal and wiki platform for cities and for citizens and organizations to rank and to create relationships and openbusinesscouncil.org a platform for creating a directory Wikipedia um, for businesses and business professionals. And of course, are as well syndicated on Intelligent HQ, FashionABC.org, EdgeFink.com and Traders DNA. So today I want to welcome uh, a very dear friend and someone that is very inspiring, but as well um, a citizen of the world and as well a citizen of hope and inspiration. Jomar Reis, someone that I know for now almost more than a decade. So I think you're getting mature, like good wines. Um, so I want to read a couple of notes about Jomar Reis. So Jomar Reis has 20 years plus of international business, traditional and business marketing experience. And um, he has uh, amazing skills from especially creating communities and taking strategical approach to business development and making and working with the latest digital marketing technologies, especially for B2B and e-commerce. is the founder and community architect of the Brand Leadership Community. Um, that is a new platform um, and the kind of a concept architecture in setting communities, industry relations and partnerships. And the platform as well has been working in cooperation with DCN Nordic. That is a platform as well looking at these areas. Jomar has a fantastic background and he's been working and collaborating with brands such as Apple, Adobe, Avid, Autodesk, and I can go through the list, which is quite impressive. He always as well um, has been consultant and advice on e-commerce and uh, working with companies like uh, um, Bangor Olofsson Play, L'Oreal, Philips, Philip, Philipson Wine, and as well has been working a lot in content marketing in articles and TV production for Saxo Bank in the past, and as well um, with other leading global organizations. So I, I know Jomar for a long time, so this is a very personal and dear uh, interview to me, but as well, um, I want to talk as well about his background and as well from uh, Australia, from a Philippine origin, and as well right now living in Denmark in the Nordics, where he established as well a, su a successful network. And as well, a, a lot of the experience he has in, as a filmmaker, photographer, and sound design. Uh, he has been as well working specifically when he was in Australia in a lot of these things, and he has produced a digital media festival. So, Jomar, welcome to our series. I could go still to look at all your achievements. You're a very yeah, humble thanks. person, but it's important <laughs> to highlight that. Yeah, thanks, Dean. It's like, wow, it's like, who's this guy you're talking about? He's done some really cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, I have, uh, I'm actually very excited to talk with you, with a lot of people around the world listening to us and sharing as well a lot of our views. We have a, a friendship, but as well, we have a professional relationship, but we've been actually through some challenges and opportunities as well. So, so we, we do go way back, which is a uh, uh, very inspiring beginnings uh, to when I moved here in Denmark, I think, uh, you were the first interview and the first job that I had or project I had in, uh, in, in Denmark, which was, uh, which was great. And it was a great start to, uh, to the chapter here. 
Yes, you have uh, multiple chapters in your life, and I want to touch that as well. So I want to start by, and normally I do that, but in your case, I want to even touch more deep on that. So you have, uh, well, you are an Australian right now, Danish person as well, which is a, but you have as well a, a Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia background with the Philippine origins, but as well completely Australian. I would say that, I don't know how you identify yourself. I want to start yeah. by, by that cultural background, because yeah. I think that makes your character and personality and then as well work ethics very special so i would like to start by that before we go to the rest of the things yeah i mean what what you're saying is if you know that's years of therapy uh, needed to discover who my, my own personal um I, you know identity and i think you know if you looked up identity crisis in the dictionary uh that's kind of what i had to live with since i can remember to uh you know to going through school through studying and having a career is who am I, you know, uh, so uh, Filipino born, moved to Australia uh, when I was six months old. Uh, so I grew up in Australia in the 70s. Uh, now you got to understand Australia just came out of, was coming out of something called the white Australia policy. So there was some um, inherent, um, I, I wouldn't say racism, but, you know, maybe a bit of that, but it was, uh, but I remember for me in the younger ages growing up, I knew I was different. Uh, and I grew up in a very nice working class area to start with. Uh, my earliest memories is having great friends, but I was different because I remember, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of not light skinned as others, but one of my friends saying, um, the reason you're darker is that you, you need to wash yourself a bit more. Now it wasn't a joke. He was genuinely concerned. And I, as a five, six year old, I used to say, this stuff doesn't come off, you know? So um, it, it was knowing that I was different from a, a very early age. And I think going through life, you having your own differences being a disadvantage to something that you embrace and that's something that doesn't make you different and, and, and use that as a strength, I think is really important. So, um, so it is something I re realized earlier on. Uh, and culturally, you mentioned like uh, the background culture, what I brought to Australia was I have the Australian uh, uh, mentality and uh, camaraderie uh, and the care and the interest in other people uh, and the Filipino values I have of, um, of laughter and fun and, uh, and, and, and really respecting your elders. Uh, I think that's important in societies that, especially today, we get so much information online that we don't often feel the need that we need to ask someone who's been around a bit longer for their input or their advice or their experience. So, um, so I'm, I'm really big into uh, uh, mentoring and being mentored is, is a hard thing to find a good mentor, but I have a lot of mentees out there that have active, actively approached me and said, hey, uh, you've been my mentor for the last year. I'm just telling you now kind of thing. Uh, and it's kind of a buzz. And sometimes uh, I'll get people actually ask me, can, can you mentor me in this? Um, so like, like going through my whole career path uh, and that early stage, um, and trying to discover who I was and what I was good at uh, being a creative, which can also be a curse because as a creative uh, to focus and uh, we can create stuff and have ideas in our heads, but we're always thinking. And, you know, we deal with a lot of people who are operational stuff and they can do stuff very quickly and effectively. But I think finding the crew of people that you have is important who, who can support you and your creative ideas through life. Um, so having the, the background in, in, in values and culture and creativity, I think are the things that kind of define who I am and I'm still discovering who I am at 52, the age of 52 now. So, so, uh, I, but I think things get more, you appreciate stuff as you get older. Um, and I, I do appreciate the diversity that I have within me, um, living here in Denmark, uh, with my Danish wife of twin the four years, um, I've learned a lot. And I think the important thing for me is to be a, a permanent learner. And, uh, and like whenever I'm uh, guest lecturing with uh, students, I'll say, you know, your studies do not end when you graduate. You should constantly be studying through life, right? Um, but, you know, for me, having the, the cultural, the, all that different background and stuff, uh, having a curiosity, permanently being curious and permanently um, 
learning and meeting new people and being curious about other people has really opened up my creativity into the filmmaking and the music and the business and photography uh, and now digital media as well uh, as we share that passion, Denise, with, uh, with creating communities, having online presences and platforms and now the ecosystem of, of the community, especially in the, the pandemic age, uh, community relationships are being redefined, right? So, so yes, yeah, so that's that's a bit of the mishmash, which is me getting to where I am today. If if you want to have a look at that as an as an as an introduction, no, oh, that's wonderful, and I think that's what makes you so special as well in all the the different areas and even the way you approach work ethics and relationships, which I admire a lot. So, I want to go right now in terms of uh, so. Um, Outside of the cultural, there's, of course, a background overview education, the way you start in Australia and then the way you end up actually in, in Denmark. Can you tell us about this background, this overview, the different education and as well the, the different profile? Because you've been actually shifting industries, although always in the creative industries and as well on the so-called, I think now we call it creative industries, but digital right now more and more is becoming digital industries. So a bit of that background uh, from film to, to a lot of different areas that you've been doing. Yeah. See, see the funny thing is, like, uh, I'm not an academic, although I have lectured and I've created a, a, a course. Uh, you know, I went to high school, uh, but I didn't get the marks to get into university. But the opportunity that I did have was through one of my classmates, whose father was, uh, was a, a director at IBM. And, uh, you know, I got a job through him and together we were working in the IBM warehouse driving fork trucks. And uh, one of the things my mum said was, um, IBM is a great company, you stick to it and you learn how to type. So I learned how to touch type and computers are very important. Uh, so not really having the formal education, I can almost see as an advantage also with the disadvantages as well. Um, so when I was at IBM, They, there was they offered a lot of professional training and in fact you were downgraded if you didn't do training so whether you worked uh, a cleaner in the warehouse or if you're an analyst or a manager you had to do a certain amount of training every year so I in starting my career I did some really fantastic courses um, presentation skills facilitation skills I did a program uh, that studied some SQL and the great thing with that was I was able to apply what I was learning the next day Um, and I think a lot of the challenges that uh, uh, the late uh, Ken Robinson covered, uh, the, the, my, my favorite TED talk was, um, you know, does uh, education uh, kill creativity? And, it, you know, you have to agree with that to a degree is that sometimes um, uh, traditional tra uh, education can take the curiosity out of the human, the human being because they're told this is the one way Whereas now we live in a world where there is no one way of doing something. We can have a goal that we want to achieve, but there'll be multiple ways. So for me, in terms of uh, education and training, I, I like to look at, to me, I'm a learner by doer, by doing. Um, and, uh, and I'm a very hands-on guy, as you know. You know I, I build my own WordPress backend. I do my own editing on Final Cut. I, um, I, you know, I, I'm using a HubSpot backend as well. To, to me, it's very important to get your hands dirty. And often uh, when I have worked with graduates, they get a, a great history lesson in terms of marketing and business, but they're not quite job ready yet. And that's often the challenge. So I, I really like to challenge the whole educational uh, way of looking at getting um, people ready for industries Has to, there has to be more of a hands-on approach. And I think a lot of the colleges in Denmark are starting to focus on internships. And in my previous job at IH Nordic, I had built a team of three student workers. Uh, and my approach to them was, um, okay, we're going to have a meeting with Google. We'd have the introductional meeting with Google to, to do some um, uh, cooperative marketing with them. And I'd say to the student workers, so are you ready to take the lead on this? And they're like, well, what? And I say, wouldn't it be cool to have working on the business plan with Google on your CV. I go, yes. And I said, well, it's yours. Take the lead. Um, I'll be here to support you. If you have any questions, let me know. If I see anything out, you know, that, that might walk into trouble, I will let you know. So, you know, when you watch uh, how, how foxes and wild animals train their young, it's really learning by, 
by teaching by example, right? So, and throwing them into the deep end. Uh, that's how I learned was that baptism of fire. So uh, a lot of the training courses that I've developed over the years and the master classes and bringing in uh, masters, it has to have that hands-on element. And I think that uh, my experience with working with a lot of really intelligent grads from um, their bachelor's or master's degrees is, is helping them find out what they don't know. There's a lot, they bring in a lot of uh, disciplines, uh, a lot of information, but applying that can often be the challenge. And I think the challenge we have in the industry at the moment is there's a big mismatch in the skills that are needed. And the other problem is that companies know they need to go digital, but they, they don't know what to ask for or they ask for the wrong, wrong things. So we're seeing a lot of cases where people, the job that they applied for, the job that they get, isn't the job they end up doing uh, because the department of the company has to pivot. So my approach to education, because I think it's really important, is that it has to be redefined and has to work a lot closer with industries. So if you look at the brand leadership community, we'll be rolling out masterclasses taught by people who are actively working in the industry, in e-commerce, uh, in, in marketing, uh, and they will set the curriculum and I'll work with them to make it so that it, it does fit into something that's tangible that, that the students can actually walk away with or the professionals who take the courses can walk away with. So I'm really passionate about learning. I, I think uh, the industry, the educational industry, the colleges and universities, the ones that are redefining the learning process are the ones that will really step out in the future. So, so, um, so yeah, so I, I do have some very clear thoughts about, about training and learning and you don't want to have an educational institution pumping out a lot of graduates that can't address the brain drain that's out there. So, um, so yeah, so, so again, I like to shake it up and that's kind of my approach. Um, People might challenge me back, maybe academics, but, you know, they could be right. I could be right. But at the moment, I feel like uh, having worked in multiple companies and seen uh, people apply their skills and, and the whole learning process doesn't end when you get that certificate. You are a, a lifelong student. Probably the biggest challenge we're facing right now is that we have uh, all these digital tools that everyone uses, but very few people know how to use it from making money to making business to making a career. And although we spend like hours and hours in front of devices, probably more sometimes than it passes with our relatives and the loved ones um, mm -hmm. for work, but as well for entertainment. But a lot of people have no clue how to monetize this. So there's a big challenge. So I want to start with the, of course, is a one story that I really love. The interview you did with a, a filmographer, one of the leading Hollywood um, personalities. I want to use that as well as part of your experience of starting with the film uh, work that you did, but as well a documentary that you could never put it live completely, um, at least make it in the, the work that you do. And I want to use that as a case study to show the significant uh, changes that filmmaking and film and digital operated. Because when we did it, it was still film 35 millimeters. And now we are in a completely different world that actually film right now is kind of disappearing, as we know, as the cinemas are closed because of COVID-19. So I would like to, to touch that. I, I want as well for you to tell that story. I think it's a wonderful story. And life yeah. is made of stories. And that, as well, yeah, absolutely. probably from that, looking at the evolution of film and the digital industry. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I was, uh, this is around 2008, 2009. Uh, I was finishing up my tenure with the, the digital media festival uh, that I produced with the digital media world magazine. And we, we did a lot of work with the, um, with the Australian um, film and animation industry uh, doing conferences and the magazine. Uh, and I was dealing with um, I was business uh, head of um uh, business development marketing for the for the uh, for the company, which was the events and the magazine. So I was in a great. It was probably the funnest job that I had because it was right in the creative industries. So I had clients like Sony, Apple, Panasonic, Dell, HP, um, Avid, and uh, and Autodesk. So Autodesk they do the three D software Maya and three D Studio Max, which all the 
the uh, the industry, uh, film and television and gaming, use this 3D software. Uh, so they were like uh, my clients uh, that I'd be working with, helping them promote and market their wares in this community called the Digital Media Festival. Uh, and uh, it was it was 2008 when my contact uh, at Autodesk said to me, um, said, we have this uh, guy called Ron Cobb uh, and we want to do an event with him, but he doesn't fit our guidelines because he doesn't use our product. And I said, okay, so Ron Cobb, uh, who is he? And he said, well, if you look at his profile, he has a Wiki Wikipedia page. He, um, uh, he is the uh, art director for Conan the Barbarian. He designed the DeLorean in Back to the Future. Um, he uh, d designed the interior for the Nostromo in Alien and Aliens. Uh, and he said, uh, and if you, if you like, could you please run this independently of your company? And I was at the process of, of setting up my own company at the point in time because kind of hit a ceiling and we were kind of going in, in different directions. Uh, and this was kind of like the, 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 the pivot for me. And I said, yes, let's, let's have a look let me meet Ron. Well, he said, well, let's set up a meeting. And he said, uh, okay, the meeting's on a, on a Tuesday afternoon, but you need to clear your calendar. And I said, what do you mean? That isn't an hour enough. He said, no, an hour won't be enough. Um, so we met in a cafe, uh, Ron. And so Ron has, you know, personal relationships with Steven Spielberg, James Cameron, uh, George Lucas, the big names, the Brat Pack, as he called it. And uh, he's an American man. He was in his uh, 70s at the time. And he spoke. Uh, he was absolutely captivating. Not only could he tell stories about, about his work uh, in the 70s and the 80s, but his storytelling was amazing and his thoughts. And uh, he was, uh, in his mind, he was a scientist as well. Uh, he wasn't a trained scientist, but he was fascinated with nature and uh, space and particularly space and making sure that that in films, things were truly reflective of, of science. Uh, so this three, four hour meeting where I was just absolutely captivated with, by this man was, uh, I was blown away. And my contact Joe was just looking at me, looking at him saying, see, I told you. Uh, and Ron was an amazing guy because he had, he, he was connected to the stars, but he loved meeting people and he made you feel special as well. Um, and, uh, one of the big things I remember that we did was uh, as I got to know him, I got one of uh, Rosemary, a, a girl who was working with me to uh, help with, with the business to arrange a meeting, a lunch, well, a meeting with um, uh, uh, one of the big filmmakers in Australia. Um, and, uh, and that was kind of, kind of amazing that, that I helped introduce him to other uh, big film filmmakers as well so uh and that was an honor to be able to get him to sit in front of other contacts that we would make uh and he would like kind of get to know them as well and to facilitate that uh but one of the big things that i wanted to do was actually um uh i was so captivated by him i thought okay i need to create a documentary with this guy i had an, the event with uh, autodesk that i was going to produce with them I had sponsorship from some great companies like Sony and, um, and uh, Wacom as well. Uh, so what we did was I got some of the funds there, but then I spoke to some, a lot of friends and people who would put in time to do an interview documentary with Ron. We had a lot of his artwork as well, which we took photographs of. Um, he showed me the, the picture of the DeLorean uh, and he said, this is what Stephen approved. And I went, Stephen, what are you talking about? He goes, Spielberg, like you idiot kind of thing. Uh, and it was amazing to see him handle his own artwork so irreverently. And I was like, please be careful with that. That's, that's a piece of history there. But then I realized this is the artist. If he leaves a mark on it, that's a part of the artwork. That's a part of history. Um, so basically we, we shot a 37 minute documentary where we were interviewing him um, and he was able to um, tell a lot of his stories and we showed, showed a lot of his artwork. Um, and I, I produced some, uh, some clips, some very short clips and published them on, on YouTube. Uh, unfortunately, what happened is a lot of the artwork was owned by the studio. So he would actually have to um, 
try and secure his artwork afterwards because what the studios would often do is they would destroy all the original artwork for whatever reason, I don't know. But, um, but when I produced some of the, uh, the clips from the, from the, for the uh, trailers for the documentary, we were approached by a, I was approached by an American lawyer and was issued with a takedown notice. So we produced the documentary, put it onto DVD, and we actually then, um, uh, I wanted to, I released it on the Creative Commons license. Um, and I also uh, gave Ron a bit of money as well for his time uh, from the sponsorship and production costs. Uh, so now we've, we've got it on DVD and I've got it on the private uh, Vimeo account <laughs> online, ready to view. But it's, it's a shame. I'd love to release it one time. Unfortunately, Ron passed away uh, a couple of months ago in 2020, this year. Uh, and that was uh, like really, of course, he was uh, 82 by now. So we don't live forever. And, it, you know, but I always wish that I could fly him into Europe and, and run a conference here with him. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's just one of those things that, that, that wasn't, wasn't meant to happen. But, uh, but I developed a friendship with him to the point where he would, uh, in Australia, where he would uh, invite me over for um, uh, Sunday afternoon screenings because he was on the Academy. So he would have to vote for films to be uh, for, the, uh, for the Oscars. And he had to watch about 30 or 40 films every year, but he would turn that into a social event. So I went and we watched one of the films, but we ended up all talking while the film was in the background as well. And, you know, I mean, listening to Ron was a hell of a lot more interesting than watching any movie out there because he had some great stories. So um, I'll, hopefully I'll be able to release it soon on, uh, and, uh, and people can see the man who, who is Ron Cobb. There are some interviews out there on, uh, on YouTube that you could look up, but he was a, uh, an amazing man, and, and again, just one of the th things in my life that I'm, I'm really happy to have uh, been a part of, to produce a 37-minute uh, documentary, to work with great people in doing that as well. Um, and it's, it's a bit of legacy that, that I hope can, um, you know, uh, release again. But, uh, but he was a great man, and uh, I'm, I'm totally honoured to have known him. And I think that's what life is about is is really crossing paths with great people, whether they're known or unknown. Uh, that's, that's life, right? Yeah, I urge everyone listening to us to go to the website of the late roncob.net. And I think it's really a wonderful story and I wanted to highlight that. So I, I want to touch that, uh, Jawar, from, from that story. It shows as well the evolution of film industry. Um, and as well from cinema rights that were completely sacred cows to right now a culture that everyone <laughs> copies everything and that it's as for instance you could not publish a, an interview <laughs> there was an interview with with someone like that because of rights because and I, I found that as well but now we are in a digital world where everyone quotes everyone and actually the film industry is more dependent on people like us than ever um, mm -hmm. so I, how do you see this evolution as well because I think it's an interesting point and I think it's something that you've been working in these areas, yeah. um, especially from film to digital to, to documentary, from doing things uh, projected to doing things on streaming, all these yeah. different things. And, and like, as you know, I also started a blog site, uh, musicproducersforum.com in 2007. And that's how we met. That's uh, what, you really, what you really liked about my profile because I was connecting producers all over the world and organizing meetups. Um, and as usual, the music industry is the first one to go through this disruption, as you know, from the, um, from the days of Napster to, uh, to iTunes to now Spotify and Pandora. Uh, one of the things that I like is starting to evolve is uh, what we see now with TikTok is that uh, the music labels have come to agreements with TikTok where it gives the users the rights to use the music. And what's happening is that we're having... Uh, new artists that are being born out of TikTok. So by getting a, a, an influencer on TikTok, dancing to a, a tune that becomes viral, not because that dance is viral, but then other people release their own TikTok dance to a song. I, I think that's really fantastic. Um, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's a shame when I, I can't release a 37 minute bit of footage because I'm not sure if I'm going to get a takedown order on on drawings that are owned by uh, by a studio, um, but uh, but I think if they look at the model of how TikTok is moving 
uh, if you have a look at what uh, what Microsoft are doing now with their 360 and uh, their Xbox Live, it's we're moving from uh, the, from an owner based society to a subscription based society as well. So um, the owners of content are happy to license out what they do rather than be very protective about who owns how many copies. So if you look at, I, I just set up a, an account for my son who is playing a game, uh, uh, Thieves of the Sea, fantastic game uh, on the Xbox network. Now he's playing it from a PC and we've just ordered uh, a, uh, I think it's like a $10 or US dollar a month license. It's 79 kroner, Danish kroner. So he can download a whole bunch of games on a monthly subscription fee. So uh, instead of buying all those games independently, so it's the Spotify model, it's the Netflix model, which is starting to take over. It's going from ownership to, um, uh, from owning to renting uh, intellectual property. You know, I still have a, uh, an attic full of CDs and DVDs that my wife wants to throw out, but I can't throw them out. Uh, uh, I used to have a lot of vinyl, which I gave away and I hugely regret now uh, because while I can access all those uh, on Spotify, I don't have that vinyl, that tactile experience. Um, and this is the thing, is that media consumption has changed so much uh, that the owners, the rights holders, are also struggling to keep, keep up as well. So, um, so that's, that's one of the challenges. You know, we're seeing men at work being sued for um, a land down under and it's sending, you know, members of the band broke uh, because someone else bought the rights to a song called um, Kookaburra Sits in an Old Gum Tree. Now that melody riff appears in the song and the new right owners of the Kookaburra Sits under the Old Gum Tree is now retrospectively suing Men at Work for using that song, which they didn't own at the time, but they bought the rights of. And I think that's so ethically wrong. Uh, and now we have artists like Men at Work who are struggling. Uh, hopefully they're, they're uh, able to live off other royalties, but it, it was, a, from what I read, it was a huge backward step for them to be able to pay back the royalties that they've earned from the song to a company that had nothing to do with the creation of that melody. So, um, but hopefully... The, the whole situation with digital rights, um, you know, we had that whole fiasco with DRM, digital rights management in the early 2000s, for those who can remember. Um, that's the industry is trying to find what the right solution is. We had Napster coming in and disrupting the market by pirating and making it available for anyone in the world with an internet connection to download any song that was peer-to-peer. -peer. So you'd upload, you'd have on your library would be available to appear to anyone else in the world to download the songs. Uh, then we saw um, Apple come in, Steve Jobs, and um, change that to the, the iTunes model. And then we've seen what happens with um, where you pay for download. And then we've seen Spotify and Pandora come in, the subscription-based model uh, where it's a monthly fee. And then we have other challenges of who's being paid uh, the right amounts. Are artists being paid the right amounts for for uh, the streams that they get. And the challenge for artists is if, they've, if their music is released through, through an agent, through a manager, through a producer, their share gets more and more diluted. Um, I recently interviewed a couple who were producing uh, uh, background music. Um, they have, uh, they're on the music producers forum, they had 100 million streams of their music so my calculation is they've earned half a million US dollars. They had no label. They had no manager. Uh, because it was background music and some of the playlists out there, people are listening, have background music on. The royalties they got were absolutely phenomenal uh, out of a few songs. Um, but they've never had to deal with the label. So the, the industry is totally changing. Yes, there is more power to the independent, but the independent is also surrounded by a hell of a lot more independence with access to the internet. So it's an exciting time. It's um, where is it all headed? Um, your guess is as good as mine, but I think the subscription model needs to mature. Um, 
and uh, labels and the traditional incumbent uh, studios and music publishers need to find how they service the industry, not how they profit from the industry. So I think that's that's the main thing. So question, what happened to the music uh, music producers forum? Yes, so so that's still there. Um, I, I kind of got distracted over the years. So I started that in 2007. Uh, I set up a meetup.com group uh, and then started uh, and I bought the domain musicproducersforum.com. So in the late 2000s, I was doing meetups uh, in Sydney and Copenhagen and London. And then I did a remote one in New York with some uh, partners who was helping me with the Music Producers Forum. Uh, over the last five to six years, I've been distracted in agency world. Uh, the community on LinkedIn is still growing. So there's, I think, 30,000 members on the, on the uh, Music Producers Forum group. Uh, but LinkedIn's a strange animal. It's not as community friendly as it once was because now it's uh, you know, part of Microsoft, part of a publicly listed company. So the group is, is more a lot of people sharing and spamming. Um, the music producers forum.com. I, I recently relaunched the site went down uh, a few years back um, and I'm just recovering some of the old content uh, over time, but I'm hoping to revive the music producers forum under the creative industries uh, banner once we get uh, the new venture that I've got with brand leadership community up and running and as the team grows is to really uh, refocus uh, what, what we're doing uh, with the creative industry. So that is something that's uh, back on my roadmap at the moment. My focus is on, um, is on the, um, uh, the brand leadership community. Uh, once I've built that, I can then uh, revisit the other communities that I've worked in the past and some of the ones that we're looking at in the future. But at the moment, we're a small team of about uh, five people. Uh, so that's pro bono uh, and, um, and uh, very engaged people in the industry that are working on our projects at the moment. Um, so so uh, we're, we're driven on passion and we're running on, in Australia, we say the smell of an oily rag, but I hope to really reinvigorate the Music Producers Forum probably mid middle of next year. Uh, and I also have the film production forum as well and create that under the creative industries uh, uh, umbrella group. So there, there, there is a whole um, a plan to return to that. Fantastic. But certainly what I learned from doing that in the 2000s, I'm now I've applied to uh, my job working with you in the finance industry um, and also what I'm working on now uh, in the brand leadership community. So So, but I've really discovered that community is the key word. Uh, you know, network is, is amazing, but if you are not, if you don't have a relationship with that network, if it's just a list, then it's just a list. So the secret, and as you know, is how do you cr create compelling content and engage people in the industry, you know, as you're doing interviewing interesting, in inspirational people, leaders, innovators, um, you know, that's, that's where I think we have a very similar DNA is, It's not only being inspired by other people, but but taking their story like I do with Ron Cobb and telling the story because often some of the great stories are untold. Uh, and I think one of the things that you and I share is a passion for getting people to tell their stories and getting those untold stories told. You mentioned the brand leadership community. So can you tell us about the the platform? You are the founder and as well yeah, yeah. So, the architect. So that's, that's again, that's a that's a, a product that we've, we've soft launched it. Uh, I call it my Corona pivot. Uh, at, at the time earlier in the year, I was working with a company called IAH Nordic. I was head of events and partner relations. So as Corona hit, I knew that things had to change. Um, and the company was, you know, we had to pretty much wind down our events team. Uh, but for me, it was an opportunity to pull forward plans that I had to, uh, to build a professional community for people who are passionate about the brand, as I am, as you are. Um, and people who are passionate about brand and branding, I find have a very special uh, creative edge, whether you work with data, whether you work on the visual side, whether you work on the promotion uh, or, or the um, uh, uh, development or the user experience side, 
everyone that I've met who works in brand are hugely passionate and really interesting people. The challenges that we have is all the, the specialized area, whether it's in analytics, whether it's in paid media, or whether it's in inbound, or whether it's in, um, in design, they, they all live in their own, their own silo. Um, and even for them to knowledge share amongst themselves can be a challenge let alone to, to knowledge share with the other areas that are important with the brand. So the vision with the brand leadership community is to connect everyone who's passionate about brand. So brand leadership is everyone's North Star. So what very similar to what you're doing with Cities ABC is, is uh, we're running a, what I call a web, webcasts um, you know, which are beyond the webinar webcast is where we almost have a TV production uh, production value um, where we in, interview and, and have a conversation with people. So what I'll do is I'll set three questions uh, together and I'll ask either a panel of two or three people um, and we'll have a, pre a preparation meeting beforehand to, to go through that. And then what I find is that this format, instead of doing a webinar, where people are doing the death by PowerPoint, as, as we, we call, um, we have a conversation. And I, I feel that that format of conversation is something that's been forgotten in society because we're so switched on, we're so knowledgeable. The answer to everything is a smartphone away. And what that has done is it's taken uh, away the questions that people would ask each other we, have, we now live in a society where everyone wants to tell people something, but no one is really asking, so what's your experience with this? Or how did you find, I mean, you're an exception to the rule because you are a very inquisitive person and you're interested in other people. But I think that in society, now that we have this amazingly powerful tool, um, it's taken away the art of conversation, the art of asking people what it is that uh, they think uh, where it is they're going. Uh, instead, it's people are telling what they what they think, telling people where they're going. And I kind of think that that's, I, I miss it. But I love when I talk to the older generation, you know, uh, you know, the baby boomers and above, the ones that love telling stories or the ones that will actually ask you. So I th also think the art of storytelling in conversation has also diminished quite a lot in, in today's age where everything's about the 30 second attention span or the 15 second attention span, the TikTok, the swiping and all that stuff. So for me, the brand lead leadership community is about bringing in conversations, more, more deeper conversations across the different areas of brand professionals. Um, and there are some great stories that, are, that need to be told and get out there and, uh, the, the byproduct of this is I'm introducing people to each other and seeing those relationships uh, develop as well. Um, and what I have behind the brand leadership community is, uh, is an advisory group of uh, currently 40 people who are kind of like the lookalike audience of the branding industry. Uh, and we've had so far had two meetings. So once a quarter we'll meet uh, and that's an opportunity to knowledge share for each member to share what it is they do, what they're passionate about with the brand. Um, and what happens is they end up connecting with each other. They end up asking each other questions and sharing. So, so it's these kind of ecosystems that you create uh, and you have an idea of what you want it to produce, but then it starts producing other magical things and other relationships and other initiatives that you didn't plan for and you just need to be ready to pivot and and be mindful of what you expect but be open to what you don't expect because sometimes the best ideas are not your ideas they're just things that evolve um, so these are all funny things that i'm learning uh, every day uh, and that i've learned in the last five months of creating this community um, but i'm very much interested in slow growth so we could get 10, 20,000 followers if we did a, a like campaign, uh, really push it. But I'm really focusing on building the foundations of, of great people um, and letting it grow, the whole organic growth uh, kind of thing. So, uh, so that's kind of the essence of where we're at at the moment. 
But, you know, if you ask me in three months' time, I might tell you a totally different story what the brand leadership community is, hopefully not too different. But it's, it's really an evolving ecosystem, uh, which is, for me, again, has been a, a total honor to be a part of when I meet some great people from senior specialist to C-level to, to, uh, to other directors and for them to say, wow, this is fantastic. Because what I also do is I help promote their personal brand uh, they get a public profile under brandleadership.community. It, you know, it, it also helps them get seen and help their story get told. So, um, so that's kind of like the sporadic answer of what is the brand leadership community. But again, I think it follows the same values that people like myself and yourself have in terms of uh, dealing with uh, professionals, dealing with community, dealing with values, dealing with relationships. So so it is uh, something I'm really proud of at the moment. And um, I'm spending a lot of my spare time sneaking off into my little man cave, uh, working on the next page or the next uh, webcast that I'm putting together. So, um, so yeah, so watch this space. I want to talk, um, and we passed right now one hour, but I still have two or three questions. So one is that you've been growing communities, especially working with marketing, e-commerce and brand leadership in multiple industries. You mentioned film, music, uh, brand in particular. So can you tell us about, um, and I think there's been an evolution of all the technologies like you mentioned. So how do you see this part of building communities right now, especially with the evolution of tools and, and as well building solid communities because in the end of the day, um, there's sustainable communities. And I think one big challenge is that a lot of these communities are very dependent of, like you mentioned, LinkedIn's, Facebook's mm. and, and uh, uh, Instagrams or whatever. Yeah, that's absolutely one thing I agree with. I think uh, this pandemic age has basically uh, brought five years ahead a lot closer. I think um, I, I think we've seen over the times that we've been talking, uh, uh, Dennis, from our, our times working in 2010 in, in a financial institution, the word content marketing hardly existed. The word social media manager didn't really exist. Social media was was the, and I know I, I worked on some social media as well, but it wasn't a full-time job. It was a part of many things or it was something that the intern would do. Um, I, I think uh, we're seeing a lot of agencies evolve. Uh, some merge, some go out of business. Um, I think any agency or consultancy that's involved with a brand uh, really need to redefine their business model from the management consultants out there, the big names, to the smaller independent agencies. Smaller ind independent agencies can be a lot more agile with moving with, with the needs of branding and technology. You know, we live in a world where um, uh, data, the, what a brand has, you know, data once upon a time is something that an agency presented on a PowerPoint sheet to their client and all they got was a chart it wasn't really data it was a chart it was a rendered chart that you couldn't dig into now the trend is that brands really should have a data strategy why because that is probably one of their biggest commodities or assets that they can use to tap into uh, their business to tap into how they're perceived by their customers and by their clients and by their potential customers and clients so you have your your, um, your business intelligence data, your CRM data, and your production data or your ERP data, big data. And then you have your online data. So the smart companies are starting to combine those two together. And if you combine your, your company data, your, your offline data with your online data, you get what people's intentions are combined with what people have done. So there's some... We're still a long way from that. We're still a long way from companies realizing that data is data. And currently there's a split between marketing data and business data. It just should be data. Um, because once you have that data working properly within your organization, then you can also reduce your costs of operations. You can reduce your costs in marketing. You can increase your targeted advertising, spending less money with getting greater results. You can service your customers better because they're getting the right information at the right time. Uh, they're being followed up. It's not just marketing. It's not just sales. It's also your customer support, your, um, your post sales, your accounts department, how they engage 
with the customers can be improved through the use of data. Now, most problems that companies have today is they have all the data, but they can't put it all together. So um, uh, the pandemic age is showing that those companies who have their data, who have their e-commerce platform set up, who have really uh, invested in the digital transformation, they are reaping the rewards through the, pan through the pandemic uh, times of, uh, of COVID-19. The brands who may have been strong that don't have an online offering are really challenged. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's sad to see that people have had their heads in the sand for too long and it's taken a pandemic to actually bring a lot of these lessons home that a lot of people like you and I were saying, you should focus on when your technology, you know, all, to all the big brands, but when they're stuck in legacy, it's very hard for them to move and change their ways. So I, I think in answering your question, I think uh, the change is realizing that the importance of your own data is one of the fundamental things a company needs to have if they are going to evolve, if they're going to survive, if they're going to thrive into the future and, and not be a, a, a dinosaur brand. Um, because data is, affects every part of, of business uh, and, and all areas of, um, of that I spoke about earlier, whether it's the analytics department or the paid media or the inbound or the design. You know, you know, data is a very important part of the future of servicing the brand. One question I have for you. So you are in Denmark, that is um, one of the leading digital economies in the world. And one of the most productive countries, I think, has been between number one to number three consistently, number mm. at least in the top three, five numbers in the last years. And as well, one of the most epic countries, I think, in terms of the rankings. Um, so you, you touched the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, there's all this accelerated digital transformation that has a social impact, um, but as well, most of the businesses are not prepared. So what experience from your experience, especially over there in Denmark, there is a personal number, there's a lot of these things that I think for the rest of the world is kind of, no one actually understands. Um, but could you tell us a bit of that experience from Australia to Denmark, and how you see as well this digital part as being part of the society and as well working with some big brands that have been profiling um, with a digital uh, um, platform brand leadership community. Yeah. So I think like the Nordic approach or the Danish approach, if you want to be more specific, is to technology is quite interesting because uh, the way that I can best describe it here is that uh, it's kind of a conservative approach. Um, so 10 years ago, uh, Denmark was very behind with social media. Uh, and in some ways, in e-commerce, uh, Denmark still has is lagging behind, say, the UK and America, and especially China. But China is a different story because it's they're, they're totally deregulated in terms of privacy, so they can you know do a lot more things that we just can't do. Um, but the the psyche of 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 the Danish culture is is really fascinating because it's if you're going to do something, do it properly or don't do it at all. Um, so in some ways that takes away out of, uh, takes a bit out of the, the experimentation, the cultural of, of experimentation, but it does mean that uh, when they do something, it's done well. They also have this thing called the Antelon where you don't say that you're better than anyone else. So whenever they do succeed, they're the quiet achievers. And you look at a lot of the Danish brands uh, around the world, no one knows that they're Danish because they don't say, Hey, this is a, a big Danish brand. So in a lot of ways, they're very much the, the opposite of, say, the US, America first. You look at brands like Lego, which is still a privately owned uh, by the uh, Danish family. You look at Carlsberg. <coughs> you look at um, um, uh, a lot of the other brands like Novo Nordisk, Maersk. These are massive, giant global brands. Um, they uh, haven't all necessarily adopted quickly or in the right way to digital and to online and they kind of did lag, but when they chose to do it, they did it really well. Um, and, uh, and, and that's a really interesting part of the culture is they're not necessarily first movers, but anyone who knows the Danish culture, it's all about design and elegance. Uh, 
And that comes out in a lot of the digital space is that when they do it, it's not the Wild West. It's they have to do it properly. So there, there's, you know, I think there's been a lot of catch up over the last four to five years and, and Denmark has come away in terms of digital. Um, but I still think there's a long way to go, particularly in e-commerce. Um, we have a lot of e-commerce associations here. Um, but again, they focus a lot inwardly. I think there's a lot more uh, that Denmark could do in terms of embracing what other countries are doing to really take it to the next step. I mean, you know, I've just started seeing click and collect uh, in some stores and it's like, this is crazy. You know, the opportunity to click, click and collect uh, has been around for 15 years and now it's, uh, it's, it's there. I still think things like omni-channel marketing, like you could integrate the retail experience with the mobile phone um, so that, you know, people are worried that they're just going to buy somewhere else online when they're, but why don't you just have a QR code if they want to buy it there and now give them an extra incentive to buy now, you know, you, you still don't see companies doing that or fully embracing the fact that a customer is walking with their competitor in their hand, that they need to compete on the mobile device while they're actually in the store. So um, I'm not sure what's happening around the world, but I'm sure, um, uh, yeah, there might be other things happening with, with that. Um, I, I think also Denmark has, uh, has got a great approach to, um, uh, you know, that elegance of doing stuff so that it, it is that simplicity in design uh, and the elegance uh, is something that does stand out also in, in the digital side of things as well. And there's, there's a lot of technologies that are, that are coming out that came from the Nordics as well. Like as Spotify came out of uh, Sweden and, um, and there's a lot of great startups that are actually starting to break through uh, in Denmark as well. There's another one, uh, Cybo Games. Uh, they did, I think it's Railway Runner that has 100 million downloads. And it's a very simple uh, game where he's running through the tunnel and picking up coins that has a massive cult following. Um, Unity, which is the, uh, the software developer kit for mobile games, which is the number one software developer kit for Android and iOS. Uh, again, that started in, in Denmark and has had investment from the US. Um, yeah, I think they quietly lead the way in, in the areas that they choose to lead in, uh, but not totally dominating, but have that quite like my approach is like to lead from, from the crowd, you know, and not standing on the box or in the spotlight, because sometimes you don't see a lot of things when you're in the spotlight, but when you're in the crowd, you observe a lot more. So I think that's something I have in common with, with the Danish culture and the way that I think as well. Jamar, it's been a fantastic privilege and I think we could take four more hours. So we'll take probably for a second Absolutely. interview. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so I want just uh, for people that uh, don't know about you or they can find you, um, uh, websites, uh, LinkedIn yes. and things like that. So, of course, so, we'll put all these links, but I think it's good to Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your LinkedIn, I'm at linkedin.com uh, slash in slash Joma. So I secured a, a five letter uh, domain on LinkedIn, which is, you know, that's pretty cool, right? Um, and that's where you'll find me. Brand Leadership Community. Brandleadership.community is where I'm spending most of my days. Um, and uh, but, but LinkedIn is, is the best way to connect with me. And uh, yeah, watch this space, I suppose. And as well, do you want to talk about just about your uh, series uh, interviews and uh, some of the webcasts that you've been doing? Yes. So we have... Uh, we've. Uh, the, the concept that we're doing is uh, I'm very much into the, the series episodic kind of um, content. So we produce um, uh, something we call webcasts. We have uh, two that we've currently started uh, producing. One is the um, brand leadership for the CXO. So CXO is uh, CEO, CMO, CFO, CDO. Uh, and my uh, colleague uh, Jens Nielsen is hosting that one and I'm producing it. So I'm, organizing the people, setting up the narrative and writing the questions. Uh, and the other one is uh, the future of e-commerce. Um, and I'll be launching soon the future of marketing. And the, for the format for that is, as I mentioned, uh, uh, two or three guests where we have three questions that we ask each of them. Uh, and it's kind of nice because each answer in itself 
is a great three to four minute uh, video snippet, uh, is a great you know topic and a great, you know, we could go on and on. And the, uh, I have no, uh, what do you call it? We've got so much content out there that uh, finding great content and great people, I'm like a kid in the candy store because there's so many topics that we cover and discuss. Uh, and we try and keep that to 45 minutes. And then I release uh, short clips for social media. Um, and then the full version you can watch by subscribing. So um, by subscribing with your, um, with your details, then you can watch the whole uh, 45 minutes uh, video on demand. Uh, and you can also register for the live uh, webcast as well. So, um, uh, so yeah, so I, I'm finding that by creating this content, the 45 minutes, we create a lot of other articles and podcasts. Um, and the other great thing is connecting with people and getting people to connect with each other, which is magic. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that's, uh, and we'll be rolling out a few other webcast series, which will turn into podcasts as well. But step by step, as you know, we're, we're still in pre-launch phase um, and we're five months old, but very excited about the future. And um, you know, everyone we meet uh, who, who approach us are, are really fascinated, fascinating people and uh, really appreciate it appreciate of the content that we've that we're creating i think it's really impressive i think it's great to catch up and look at all the wonderful things um i wish you all the success for the brand leadership community and i think branding is a key element for all of us especially the leadership around that and i know that we're going to be collaborating a lot of things so uh, keep Absolutely. posted for the ones listening to us thank you so much omar and uh, we'll put all the links to these things it's been a, a wonderful pleasure to have you here yeah, great. Great talking. Thanks again for your time, Dennis. It was great talking to you. Thank you.